Number five on the map is broken up into uh, three sections. You can go in the campus of the Center of French Colonial Life, which includes a museum, and then you can go in the Boldick House and the Le, Le Malheur House. Um, you see here the years that they were built. So on the map, you um, are here at the Welcome Center. That's always the easiest thing. Uh, and so here is where the museum is. This is where you buy the tickets. And this is the Boldeck House. So we had to walk down the street and up the block to go buy the tickets. And then you come back and you enter behind the house to start the tour. And you can you come around this way um, to go in the second house to uh, do the tour of that house. Now, number 5L, uh, we did not go in it. I guess it's part of it. Um, you see here it's a hands-on house. They say they use it um, to teach with uh, children. And here's the sheet I got from the Welcome Center. It's kind of marked up a lot. Uh, so um, it is important to note that these tours begin at certain times, about an hour apart to break for lunch. Um, it does cost $10 for adults to go on the tour of the Boldeck House and the Le Malheur House. It also cost uh, $5 to tour the uh, center. Um, we didn't have time to tour the center. We'll have to come back to do that. We want to take this tour. It says for tickets, go around the corner. Okay. To just walk around the corner. But the uh, term, uh, the French term that was used was gallery, uh, and it runs, it, it runs all the way around the house. The purpose of the roof and the gallery system is to keep the sun off the walls and generally make it slightly cooler than it would be otherwise. Uh, this, the whitewash is also geared towards uh, that purpose and that it, keep, it doesn't trap as much heat, but it's also a natural insect repellent. Now the whitewash here is not original to the uh, to the time period that we restore it periodically. In fact, that's something me and people will be taking care of in a few weeks here. But uh, if you look at the spots where it's starting to chip away, you'll notice that the logs making up the walls are vertical. This is a vertical log house of the type that is pretty typical of French Creole uh, communities in uh, southern Missouri and southern Illinois. Now, uh, we call this a post on sill house in that the uh, posts making up the wall run down into the ground and rest on top of a stone sill uh, that runs to the, the length of the footprint of the building. And that makes it remarkably stable. Between that and the roof construction, uh, this building survived the new major earthquake in the late 1790s and is still with us today, almost uh, almost 200 years later. Now, uh, you'll notice that the joints making up the roofing beams are cut off after this point. That's because this half, half of the house was added uh, after the initial construction, but it, 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 it was a pretty short period before it was added. But St. Genevieve, from its original location near the Mississippi River over to here, to much higher ground, where they're in less danger of being flooded out. Uh, you'll see some of the evidence of that flood and some of the furniture we have inside. Uh, now, the, the roofing style is actually uh, kind of a fusion of what they call Norman Truss style roofing, which I'll show you the uh, evidence inside when we go in. Uh, but it's also adapted from a Caribbean design, which is kind of why the roof looks like the roof of a Pizza Hut. It's, it's meant to emulate the buildings in uh, Martinique and Haiti and other French colonies where it was much warmer, uh, where the sun would be that much more intense. A, a couple words about the yard. Uh, a lot of people ask if this building with the door hanging ajar is a original Bolduc family outbuilding. It is not. It is actually a gift shop that was built in the 50s when the museum was first established. Uh, pretty, pretty convincing though, I think. 
Uh, they used a lot of shingles that were left over from recreating this roof. In fact, the Bulduke House was one of the earliest efforts at historic preservation back when that was still a developing science. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, the, the house was still, in, or was only recently acquired by our parent organization, the Society of Colonial Dames, and uh, they began the restoration work shortly thereafter. Uh, the, the house was almost unrecognizable compared to what it looks like by now. In fact, that's the case with many vertical log homes in this part of the country. A lot of people don't realize what they're sitting on until they have a reason to chip into the walls and see how the posts are actually arrayed. The house was inhabited by a descendant of the Bulduke family well into the late 40s. Uh, Zoe Bulduke was a many times descendant of the Bulduke family, and I'm told that she was shocked when she learned that they had taken up the linoleum that she had put down on the floors. I'm sure, I'm sure the original pres uh, preservationists were shocked to find out that she had covered up 200-year-old floorboards with linoleum. <laughs> uh, so this one right here is a recreation of the well that would have been used on the property. The, well. the original well is about 30 feet deep and sits underneath that gift shop. Uh, on our way out, you might look inside there because we have an LED light in the very bottom just to show you about how deep it is. Right. Hmm. The original would be about twice the depth of this one. And over here we have a bread oven that uh, it, it turns into a, a bread oven. To function well enough to make a pizza inside. Uh, we're hoping to yeah we're hoping to restore it later this summer so that it can, we can possibly do that again. Now the the kitchen uh, over here was added on about the same time that Mr. Bulduke passed away about 1815, and that's actually kind of an anomaly compared to the kitchens that were typically used at the time. Those almost always would have been covered in moss right kitchen now, so we're a there. few feet away from the house proper in order to uh, prevent Original kitchen fire. there. That's also the purpose of the stones that line the building. The, uh, they call that a fire break. And for us, it's been very useful just because a lot of uh, bits of broken pottery, other artifacts tend to find their way to the top of this, uh, either because animals are digging for them or a fresh rainfall. Uh, kind of displaces them. So we find pipe stems, uh, bits of clay, bits of uh, china in there all the time. The, uh, the Bulducs would have been somewhere in the top 20 wealthiest families in St. Genevieve at the time. Uh, Mr. Bulduc was a commodities merchant, which was uh, named, which his profession. Uh, he, was he would mostly work between here and New Orleans, uh, buying and selling commodities that people in town wanted. And uh, that's, that's definitely shown in a lot of the gadgets that we have in here from the time period. Uh, he also had investments in lead mining and in farming, uh, and most, but most of that labor would have been done by his slaves, which would have lived right about where our parking lot is now. But that's the uh, outer- uh, that's Slaves the, uh, would have lived way right over there. Of the, proper, the historic property, uh, which would have run from the street over here all the way to the edge of what is now our parking lot. Unfortunately, their homes no longer stand. They were demolished sometime between seven, uh, 1815 and today, simply because the property, once that large, was subdivided as time went on. Uh, Mr. Bulduke's finances went into arrears sometime after his death, uh, for reasons that we don't really have a, an explanation for. And uh, half of the houses, including the, one, the next one I'm gonna show you, uh, became separate properties. I think that covers everything I had for the yard before going in. Can I answer any other questions about the architecture or uh, the garden? Uh, like I was saying, the raised beds are accurate to the period. Uh, that is how how uh, herbs and vegetables were grown by most families in the area. Um, I might point out also the uh, purpose of the palisade wall that surrounds the uh, property. That was actually to keep livestock in and to keep other people's livestock out, since it was pretty standard to uh, leave one's cows or pigs through the streets. On their way to market. What so, did you call it? Palace State? Palisade. Uh, Palisade. P A L I S A D. Yeah. Oh. Uh, we're actually in the process of tearing it up. The uh, the Palisade wall that you see is a recreation also from the 50s. And it, I mean, it works pretty well. It's held up fairly, very well, but uh, starting to attract insects and some of them are going to rot. So we've been in the process of getting rid of them. And uh, you saw in the museum, a lot of them have uh, been placed in the exhibit that we have sort of an imitation of a fortress wall uh, as part of our exhibit on the Battle of St. Louis. Much of the original structure intact is possible, of course, but it has been necessary to install air conditioning and dehumidifiers just to keep uh, any degradation of the structure from occurring. 
Now this center room is likely, most likely would have served as the office for Mr. Bulduk. We have this uh, uh, condemnation bench and den right here because we believe his, uh, in, his assistance, a uh, gentleman by the name of Enrique, probably slept here uh, whenever he had business here in town. The desk's right here. Sorry? Spanish? Okay. Mr. Bulduk would have been, would have conducted quite a bit of business with the Spanish people that they were in control of the area. Uh, the desk here is one of the two original Bolu family artifacts we have. Now, this is the desk that he used in much of his work, and we're, we're fairly certain that on a day like today, he might have moved it outside so he could conduct his business from the porch, uh, where, which would have made it a lot easier for people to come and see him and ask, could he possibly order something for them in New Orleans and bring it back the next time he was in the city. Um, I mentioned that I could show you the Norman Trust style of roofing. Um, if you move over to about where I'm standing, you'll have the best view of it. How fun. <laughs> you can see where those joints fit together with wooden pegs, and that would have, some of you may have seen the infographic in the museum, that would have enabled it to survive the pneumatic earthquake, in part because a peg, or a structure fit together with pegs has much more room to shake during a tremor like that, as opposed to one held together with nails, which might have torn itself in half. So the roofing timbers in here are original to the, uh, the uh, structure along with the walls and the floorboards. Uh, some of this might be anachronistic. Uh, we're not totally sure if they would have used a pulley system like this to move things upstairs, but we are confident that nobody would have slept up there just because during the summer it would have been way too hot for anybody to stay in there long term. But some of our other artifacts like the gang saw we've kept up there, so it seemed appropriate. A gang saw? Yeah, no, you can kind of see it from where I'm standing. Oh, it oh two I got it. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, that is a garage door opener that we have. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. what it is. Not that there's anything down there, but there's a post that you can observe that's uh, still holding up this part of the building that looks pretty rough cut and remarkable that it survived this long. <laughs> Was this hole in the floor there originally? Uh, yes. So what, oh, we're looking at this post off to yep. the right. Yep. So that's on top of the stone sill. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, the, bl the uh, blueprints of the building, or I, sorry, the footprint of the building is on top of the sill. That's, that cellar though, that's, ju that's just dirt. Yep. It's a dirt floor. You know, it, um, it's held up pretty well because yeah. other historic houses that I've assisted with, <coughs> it's necessary to waterproof them in the cellar. It's just a dirt floor like that. But this, uh, as far as I know, there's never been any sort of drainage issues with this one. Well, that's amazing. This is uh, original. Yeah. Original. I mean, of course, you know, planks were replaced sure, yeah. but uh, most of it is original. Yeah. Um, also, you might notice the uh, port that's kind of cut in the wall over here to the uh, left of the uh, drum of the armoire. That is put in, or that was put in there, and I'm told uh, a lot of other houses in the area have them just to show the uh, vertical logs in there. It's kind of a record of how old the house is uh, for the old dukes while they still live here. As far as I know, this is the oldest structure still standing in Missouri uh, from the time period. There may be some dispute about the years among other structures, but uh, with that, it would have been much harder to contest that claim on the part of the Bull Dukes. Um, can I answer any other questions about the center room before we move on to the uh, north? In that case, uh, up until they, they also constructed the south room. Okay? Mr. Bulduk had three children by his first wife and one by his second, and I believe most of them had children of their own. So at one point, there may have been three generations of the family sleeping within this room, which is why we've got as many beds as we do in here. And it's also why we've included this table, which you might notice the seams in here, those are there so that the table can be folded down and placed up against the wall, along with most of these fairly small chairs. The, the idea was to save space, but with how little that they had to work with in here. Now the fire, of course, would have provided a lot of warmth and may have heated up the occasional pot of tea, but it was not the main cooking fire for the building. That, would have, that was in the kitchen. Um, 
You might note this, uh, set, this sawtooth design on the device hanging with the kettle. Uh, this was so that the, the, the kettle could be moved lower and closer to the flame or further up and farther away from it, so functioning similar to a burner. Uh, that, now this one is pretty rough, uh, but it's not original to the family, you know, we got it on eBay, but it's uh, pretty effective and it's one of many kind of analog gadgets that they had access to at the time, especially because Mr. Bullu could have gotten such from New Orleans if a local blacksmith couldn't have made it. Now you notice the beams running uh, horizontal across the roof here, uh, and you won't notice that in the south room. That's just because uh, in the process of constructing the south room, the design, the architectural design had changed enough that they decided not to continue uh, with uh, building these beams. And it, it seems to have saved them some labor, I would think, because the, somebody pointed out on a tour a couple weeks ago just how, how long uh, or how tall of a tree these beams would have had to have been taken from. So it would have saved them some labor in locating such a tree and planing the uh, beams down into this shape. Now, I know there's only three rooms in the house now, but at the time that it was still occupied in the 40s, uh, Ms. Bulldog, Zoe, uh, she had divide, subdivided it into even more rooms to where it would you know, somewhat resemble a modern home with more than three rooms. Of course, there's no bathroom. No, that, was, that was left out of the design for obvious reasons. <clears throat> We also point out uh, how lumpy the mattress is. So we have it like this, set up like this uh, to show how people slept back then. It was standard practice to prop one up on one side while they were sleeping because of a long-held superstition that one's lungs might collapse if they were to sleep on their back for any length of time. I tend to think of this as a, a superstition similar to believing the world was flat. Obviously, people knew there there were people who knew at the time that the world was round but it persisted for long enough that a lot of people made it their habit to sleep this way. The armoires are also a conscious choice on our part. It was not standard practice to build closets in one's home simply because that would increase the number of rooms and increase the property tax on a given property. So we held on, to, so we ordered these to you know, stand in for what the Bullion family surely would have used in order to save a little bit every year for the tax that came along. We've also got a little bit of a rougher spread uh, placed on the table here. We have some redware, some clay, pottery, a uh, wooden mortar and pestle, and a wooden uh, bowl here. Just to contrast it with what we have in the south room, which the, we have in there to represent the housekeeping that the Bulldukes did once they were firmly established here in the newer St. Genevieve. Can I answer any other questions about the north room before we move on to the south? Some people ask about the windows, if those are original. Now, the window panes are not original, but I'm told the glass was manufactured in kind of a similar way. And if you look at some of the panes, yeah, it, it, exactly. It's not a perfectly clear uh, piece of glass that's sitting in there. I have a question about what's yeah. between the planes. What is this? Do you know what that material is? It may not be old, but just. If I had to guess, this is uh, some leftover uh, bousillage, which is what is sits between the uh, planks and the walls. Mm -hmm. It's a mixture of uh, dirt, clay, mud, and uh, straw, and sometimes horse hair is thrown in there as well. It's good fibrous material for keeping it all together. Now, I imagine the biggest cracks were probably filled with that, but everything else, or any smaller ones, might have been filled with some kind of sealant that was used to predominantly used at the time. For instance, there's kind of a long uh, trench and one of, and this plank over here and this holds up well enough that I would assume that this was actually some kind of foam sealant and it has some uh, some nails put in there as well to kind of hold it in place so I would guess that this is not you know faithful to the period that probably worked well enough for their purposes when they were restoring it in the in the early 50s that, that is a good question and I'll have to follow up on that with one of my, uh, one of my Train. We're very lucky to be this close to the train tracks. <laughs> this is something I would have said back then. Uh, uh, and we're fairly certain that the Bulldukes would have used this room for gatherings, uh, you know, whenever they decided to host them. And we based that on the chair rail that runs the length of the room. Uh, the, some of our chairs were a little bit taller, but the overall purpose of the chair rail was to allow chairs to be scooted up against the wall to make room in the center without scuffing the wall. That uh, sawtooth design I was pointing out in the tea kettle earlier is also 
presence on the <laughs> chandelier here, and it would have allowed uh, for the adjustment of the lights in the room, similar to a dimmer. I tend to think also if they had, to, if they happened to have a gathering, it would have been raised so that somebody my height could avoid hitting their head and, and possibly spilling candle you know, wax everywhere. A similar uh, device meant to adjust the lights in the room is this uh, reading lamp here. Uh, we used to place candles on either one of these just to kind of demonstrate what it was for, but we kept knocking them off. So uh, th Now, this would allow the candles to be raised or lowered just to get that reading light exactly where one wanted it while reading it. That's cool. I, me I mentioned the spread we have on the table in here. Uh, we include some fine china, some Dijon mustard, a uh, bottle of wine, and some finer silverware and cutlery. Uh, just, uh, just to show that this is what the holders had access to and what they would have probably used once they had uh, established themselves here in St. Genevieve Mark II. We've, uh, we've had a lot of student groups in the last couple of weeks here. And we typically bring one of the antique toothbrushes that we have out just to show them that the standards of carver toothbrush from a, an animal's bread. And uh, we also let them know that the bristles would have also come from the animal, probably. Most no, no likely from a pig whisker that would have been placed there so that people can brush their teeth. And we've included a couple shaving basins and an angular shaving mirror for the same reason. And note, note that the mirror is a lot rougher to look at <laughs> once a day. Uh, fairly well polished, of course, and functional, but still. Not nearly as clear as the uh, uh, that we have today. Uh, I mentioned there were two pieces of original Bolu family furniture. Uh, the other one is sitting right next to me. This armoire that we are po almost positive uh, the Bolu got as payment for a debt. But what makes us so sure that it was from the time period is the flood mark. You'll notice it's a lot darker along here, so uh, we think it's fairly likely that. You know, one mo the morning of the worst of the flooding, the Baluch woke up to find himself in two feet of water and hope with it started to soak up at the bottom of the armoire. And that might have been the moment when they decided that enough was enough and that it was time to move. Now this would have been disassembled, put on a cart, wheeled over here, and then reassembled more than likely, which shows that the Baluch probably placed some value on it. Uh, the middle armoire, uh, it's in a little bit rougher shape, but we like to include it because, for one thing, the diamond battery presence on there is very typical of French Canadian furniture design. And for another, it's made of cypress, which is a lot more common in Missouri, so that makes us think this might have been constructed by a Creole yeah, in Missouri at some point between the 1780s and today. It's also held together with two or three different kinds of nails, which tells us that it was probably deconstructed and reconstructed several times. Uh, this is a bed warmer that would have been filled with hot coals and cinders uh, just to generate a lot of heat. Um, some people ask if they were if it was applied directly to the sheets uh, because, right, because uh, I guess there's a scene in Pirates of the Caribbean where they do that, but no, the, the answer is no, it would not have been applied to the sheets because this would have been a very serious fire hazard. Instead, it would have been placed underneath the mattress along the floor and the heat would have just been allowed to rise up into it. Uh, to warm it in preparation for somebody sleeping in it. We also would like to show people the part of the tuning of the rope mattress. So this uh, device that looks like a tuning peg could have been inserted in here and used to tighten or loosen the mattress as necessary. And then this peg could be placed through here in order to hold it in place, in order to ensure the, ma the mattress's tautness was where the user liked it. <laughs> More than likely, the mattress would have been stuffed with, uh, you know, some goose down, some straw, and to the greatest degree of comfort that could be achieved. But this would have been a way to uh, further that comfort. We also included a coffee bean grocer in here just because it seemed fairly likely that you know, one of the bull dukes would have enjoyed a cup of coffee while reading in the morning. A kid asked me about how long it would take to prepare a cup of coffee with one of these. I asked him, well, how dark do you like it? <laughs> and that probably would have been the deciding question. Now, I'm told the chimneys are original to the building, like those stone chimneys are original, but the fireplaces were part of the reconstruction efforts. And I can show you the evidence for that uh, in the kitchen, uh, unless I can answer any further questions about the south room at the boys of the park. Going into kitchen. Yay, kitchen. Now, obviously, 
look, the floorboards and the ceiling boards are pretty well stained in here after you know years of having a fire burning here almost constantly. Uh, you can see there's some deterioration in the mantelpiece as well as the uh, stones in the uh, shipment in the fireplace. But really, this would have been a center of constant activity for, uh, for the, most of the time that the Blues were living here. Uh, uh, P7. Sorry, that's, that's another one. And that's, that's why we think the uh, chimneys were a, re or, uh, were a reconstruct, the, sorry, the fireplaces were a reconstruction, because it's very likely that that oven space would have gone much further back into the stonework over time. You see, um, the bread, of course, is still a staple of the French diet, but especially it was back then, with all the wheat production going on in the big field a few miles up from here. So, and it would have been a constant daily chore uh, culminating in you know several loaves that would have sustained the family for days at a time, which would have been placed in a bread box like this, mainly to keep it out of the hands of the kids, but also out of the, out of the, the way from pests that might have made their way in. I'm told it was standard practice to lock them as well. Huh. So we, the one we have here, of course, does not have evidence of old ash. Um, now, mo most of the cooking, like m much of the work around the house, would have been done by slaves. Uh, Mr. Bulldog probably owned about a dozen, we believe. And they would have been responsible for taking care of the kids while also doing all of this, which is why we have this high chair over here. Uh, the hole in the bottom is used for exactly what you, you would imagine that is sort of an early training toilet for a small child who might have been placed in there while uh, somebody did uh, most of the work over here at the fireplace. And of course, we have a butter churn because what kind of colonial establishment would we be if we didn't have at least one of those? But we have other gadgets like this reflector oven. Uh, what I imagine is a rotisserie chicken being placed on the spit in here, but probably a number of things could be placed in there. Then the hatch would have been closed, and the and the device would have been moved right up against the fire, and the heat would be continually reflected on the inside to get it done on all sides like that. We also have a very early toaster. Uh, this has been stumping the kids uh, lately whenever we ask them to play the guessing game with us about what this device does. Uh, two Probably larger slices would have been placed in, on either side here and allowed to hang over the fire. Probably from an ensemble kind of like this uh, steel uh, arm that projects over the fire. It's uh, it's pretty useful for hanging you know multiple items uh, across the same flame uh, to make sure they're all getting done at the same time. Um, this uh, this very creative lever device here on this coffee pot was of course used just to tip the pot forwards so that it could be uh, used for a cup of coffee but it's also likely that they would have needed an oven bed or something similar to grasp it uh, for fear of burning one's hands. Um, I've had questions lately about what these mesh baskets are for. I believe they're used for what we have here uh, with these imitation potatoes. I, I think they would probably have vegetables or something similar placed inside so they could then be dumped in a pot of boiling water and then withdrawn safely afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. This uh, giant wooden spatula uh, to my left would probably also have been used in the making of bread, probably used to pull loaves in and out of the oven space. But what's really been stumping a lot of them is this cast iron, uh, this cast iron waffle iron. Now, the design has not really changed very much, as you can see. <laughs> I'm told the recipe is much the same too, but that would have been used you know, fairly often and just plunged directly into the flames to get it nice and crispy. We also have a series of candle makers sitting on this green armoire back here. Um, now, I believe the reason for keeping those in the kitchen would be that animal fat, after, as a pig was rendered, for instance, could be placed directly in the uh, candlesticks and allowed to congeal and to tallow candles for people for everyday use. That, that, that might seem like a lot of candles, but they also went through them pretty quickly just mm -hmm. because of how uh, essential they were for light, even in a house with three fireplaces. Um, can I answer any further questions about the kitchen? Oh, I almost forgot to mention wash, but this allowed us the chance to see how the corners of the building fit together. You might notice this diagonal beam on either side. That would have been there to support the edges of the house to keep the walls from bowing inwards. And uh, as you can see, evidenced by the house still standing after all these years, it's effective. Now, the, I mentioned the bousillage earlier that sits between uh, the wooden beams. Now this outer layer is uh, from, <coughs> is from the uh, preservationists, but if you were to chip that away past the first or second inch, you would find the original Lucia from 1785 still packed in there.
awesomeness. I'm told most of these uh, beams were shaped with axes, more than likely axes with very flat heads. Um, and you can kind of see uh, some of the chipping points uh, along the beams, like uh, you can see scoring marks here and here. But all of them are roughly square in their shape, and maybe it's just the way they've been placed, but there seems to be very little warpage in most of the walls. Now uh, you can kind of see the beginnings of one horizontal beam uh, along the uh, length of the corner here that all those that some of this would have sat on top of. But it's likely that that is a design that that's designed to accommodate the kitchen being added as well as the galleries outside. Really, these like I said, these beams. Uh, generally run all the way down into the uh, into the ground to sit on top of the sill. But yes, sir. So were, were his slaves have been sort of multi generational? Have been from from here, or would they come? Would they have come from Africa, or would they possibly have come from Haiti? It's really anyone's guess. Unfortunately, we do not have many records of their names uh, beyond maybe one or two. Um, the Valley family, for instance, uh, their house is just across the street. We have a couple records of their names, which escape me, but I know they owned a couple that worked for them their whole lives, uh, well into their 90s. Uh, I believe it was their 90s. It time to be very long with. But it, it's really anyone's guess, because New Orleans was close enough that one could possibly uh, buy, out, buy some, out some people from the slave market there. It's possible that they were descended from people who were originally brought to St. Genevieve, you know, when it was first established as a colony in 1730. And then especially after, you know, the, with the birth of the United States on the other side of the river, it uh, became practice for uh, traveling salesmen to sail down the Mississippi and, and, you know, often with human cargo to sell in various settlements along the river. Right. So it was really... But there were slaves in St. Genevieve from, like, the beginning of the settlement. Right. Beginning of the 18th century. Right. right. That, that, that's worth pointing out, though, that the French also enslaved Native Americans for much of the time that they lived here. Now, the, the practice was slightly different. It was not exactly the chattel slavery uh, with which you know African peoples were bought and sold. Uh, most Native Americans were sold into slavery by enemy tribes, who the French were often out as with. In fact, it became standard practice to report every uh, Native slave in the uh, in the census as members of the Pawnee tribe, just because the Pawnees were always a generic enemy of the French allies, like the, like the Osage and uh, other peoples between here and Chicago. And it was really, it, and generally, those, none of those people tended to, it, it made it a little bit easier for them to escape, given that they were a little bit more used to the terrain, but not always, and sometimes they were enslaved or damaged under lock and key, as was the case in the Selena affair, I believe. Right. It's always interesting how they married some of them and enslaved others. It was, it was French. They, they were integrated <laughs> into the community among the French in a way that they were not under the English, and that sometimes blurred the lines, especially down in New Orleans. But there is also here, but also especially in St. Louis, there is always there. There is often a class of a free people of color, what we call them, who were necessarily sometimes the offspring of a white man and an enslaved woman, and they said. By the time of the Haitian Revolution, many of them had moved into the middle class and occupied a lot of special, specialized positions in society. Um, it, and it raised the, the question was raised again and again if they if they inspired slave rebellions just with their presence, or if they provided uh, something of an aspiration for people who wanted to fight for freedom, which actually became much easier under the Spanish. Uh, the Sp in fact, the Spanish made it law. It was one of the few major changes they made. They made it law that an enslaved person could demand that their master set a price on their freedom. If they could pay it, then they were, they were allowed to go free. And uh, as far as we know, I mean, that, that practice was adopted here. Um, there's nothing to necessarily suggest it wasn't because there were free people living in the area that we know of. What's this one? <laughs> What's this one? Flax. And the other one was. You make linen out of it. Well, that's cool.
recommend taking one of the brochures and the post over there as you leave. It's got all the uh, different French names for a lot of the herbs that we have present here in the garden. Mm. This? You need this thing? What's that? Love in the mist. I need that one for my garden, dear. It's yarrow. Yarrow. Okay. Valeria. Valeria. Yeah. Garden meadow. What house are we getting ready to go in? This is Lemayer. Lemayer. <laughs> so, like I said, the house was constructed right around 1812 and it was inhabited by uh, Agatha Blue, Louis' granddaughter, and her husband, uh, Rene Lemayer. Rene was an expat from Haiti fleeing the revolution there, and there's a, there's a family lawyer saying that he escaped in a barrel that was floated down uh, to St. Genevieve. So this, this is probably untrue, but of course it got repeated often enough. And he was um, put there by a slave. That, that was the That's idea. The idea. <laughs> and then he was watched over by a slave who uh, was kind enough to you know, make sure he was staying afloat. Um, but they said, but anyway, he and Africa only lived here a fairly short time before the, uh, before the house was uh, repossessed by the city and sold to auction. Uh, like I said, we don't really know why his finances went into arrears, but they did, and the property was divided. So even as the Bolduc house was being restored, this was still serving its, firm, its uh, purpose uh, at the time, which was a Pontiac dealership, believe it or not. Yeah, th this house was the office for Pontiac dealership with uh, that giant backyard out there being used as a lot. Oh, God. <laughs> it, it, amazing, I know. They, it, it, it makes it a little bit easier to believe that they would have torn this down and put in a Texaco station if they had managed to buy the property before our organization got it. But it, 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 you know, it was another block of a small town that was developing pretty quickly. I, I keep hoping we'll find a hood ornament buried out in the yard somewhere or you know, unearthed by one of the fires that we've had. Um, but no such luck as of yet. Now, the next owner after the Balduc family was the son of the gentleman in the portrait, uh, Mr. Pratt. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Pratt was a contemporary of Louis Balduc's, and we know they were at the very least uh, in, uh, frequent business partners because they would often sign each other's documents as witnesses. Um, a lot of people point out that he's the spitting image of Robert Duvall, and once, once you see it, you, can't, you really can't unsee it. Um, but uh, he owned and operated the house as a bed and breakfast for some time. Uh, like I said, there's really only three rooms, this, the adjacent room, and then the upstairs, which we don't really have anything in right now. But if you look at old photos, there was actually a balcony overlooking this front porch that would have you know, given the guests some extra room if they were staying upstairs. Uh, sometime after that, it became a girls' school uh, where these two rooms were classrooms, and upstairs there were nuns who uh, would have his teachers sleeping, uh, where they stayed. But after that, it, it, it you know, passed, it traded hands several different times, and it, it needed to be restored in a similar way that the Bolduc House did once it passed into our hands. Um, we've included some imports here that you know show the house is a little bit more modern. Uh, this fine china set's a little bit more intricately detailed than the one that we have, the blue ware that we have in the uh, other house. Uh, we've also included this embroidered uh, alphabet on the, hanging on the wall there that has the name uh, Mary Louise on it. Uh, we included that because, for one thing, you'll notice the letter W is present in the alphabet, which is not in the French alphabet. But, so we like to point out that it's possible the Bolduc's living in the house in this house in 1812, you know, thought of themselves as American. It was close to, coming on close to 10 years after the Louisiana Purchase. It's possible they spoke English, you know, in their in their uh, dealings with Anglo's that were starting to move across the river. And that's why we have the U.S. flag, albeit the one from 1812, hanging outside the uh, on the porch here, as opposed to the French and Spanish flags hanging outside the Bolduc house. Some of the furniture is still multi-purpose, though. You'll notice the seams would allow these to be folded down and placed against the wall as well. Really, anything to save some space. 
and uh, what were somewhat small accommodations at the time. But you'll notice like the floorboards, which I, I believe are also original, but I'm not totally positive. Uh, they're a little bit more varnished uh, around the time that fine china came into fashion among you know, people of European descent. Uh, lacquered wood was becoming uh, the fashion because of dealings with Japan at the time. So uh, really it influenced, it, it influenced culture you know, even as far away as St. Genevieve. Now the adjoining room uh, does not really have anything in it at the moment just because we moved all of our artifacts from there over to the Welcome Center. If you haven't been over there already, I do recommend checking them out because they have a lot of our written materials as well uh, posted just to explain what everything is. Um, but we've also included this couch over here, this, uh, it's a British antique right there, manufactured there. And that, that upholstery is actually horsehair. So it's not, un it's not unbelievable that something like that could have existed in St. Genevieve in the early 19th century, but it was just too nice to not include in the, uh, in the house uh, since we were able to get our hands on it. Is this door the, the, uh, the normal atypical door that was here? I tend to believe it probably was. These double doors sort of make, kind of make a lot of sense if you're trying to control the airflow into the room. Now, a lot of the time I'll open both of them, especially if somebody with a walker is coming through here. But, uh, the, the, you know, we can just keep one of them open most of the time to admit most people. And it's, uh, I, I tend to think the design is pretty typical. With, like these locks here, these are pretty popular elsewhere in town, even in non historic buildings. But, uh, the uh, smaller knobs are something that we see in all of our historic homes. I do believe that was original. Yeah. Or at least original design. Yeah. Uh, not, some, not, not these. Well, you can see where these fit together, but I don't believe they were reconstructed to open a lot. Some of them, especially, I believe this one, were restored fairly recently. Uh, to be our restoration guy, he's really good at what he does. But they were, uh, they were winterized until fairly recently, too. We sealed them off with uh, cardboard and shrink wrap to keep the worst of the temperatures off the glass. Oh, uh, a muzzle loader. You put the powder in, you put the ball in, and you can have it pre measured or you can measure, use a little measuring device to get just the amount, right amount of powder that you want. You take out your ramrod and ram the charge home. And then, have you ever used a uh, flint lock? No. Huh, well, it's quite simple. You Amazingly simple. put it at half cock. Yeah. Half cock. Put, <laughs> yes. That, now later you're going to put it in full cock because you don't That's want to go off. Trouble. It, because you don't want to go off half cock. That's do you? Correct. You exactly. Don't go off half cock. Yes. Yeah, right. All right. So you see the little <laughs> pan there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You'll see a little hole at yeah. the end of the pan in the barrel. You put your powder in there for your primer. You close it, and then you can go jaunting about in the woods and not have to worry about your powder falling out. Yeah. But it also acts as the steel that your flint's going to strike. Interesting. So when you see something that requires shooting, you put it at full cock, and here, now I'm going to ask you to, I'll hold your. Okay. okay, what am I doing? All right, you're, you are you're pointing in that direction. <laughs> All right, now you, People come around here so you can see this. Now watch right here where the flint's going to hit the steel. It, it is not loaded. It will not make a bang, but I want you to watch right there. Fire in a hole. You yeah, go ahead. Oh God. There. Did you see this? I showed you by your window. Yes. <laughs> and, okay. Here again. Can I, can I just hold the? I just want to see how because they said heavy. they were light, and I was like, they don't look light. No, no it is not light. It's that, not light. That, no. no, this is this is what this is a French military musket. So this is what I was using when I it was in the service of the king mm, twenty years ago, and uh, <laughs> and I love it because it has a certain. Now, if I were to trade this to one of my Native American friends, mm -hmm. say one of my Osage friends, they would say, "Oh, this is beautiful." <laughs> And he would take it, and the first thing he would do, he'd cut it off about here. Oh. And then he'd shave the stock down, or even cut the stock back. 
and he would make it as light as he could make it because they traveled great distances to go hunting. They can see a gorilla gun. And, and they prefer a very light gun. It's like when you look at a trade gun. Now this is not a, this is a military bus, mm -hmm. but a trade gun, they are wonderfully light. That's and right. Back in the day when they all stood in a line and shot each other until they all fell down. Mm -hmm. Genius <laughs> but, but, but yes, exactly. Genius but it's plan. like one shot and you're, how do you reload it? Same all right, the whole process. You go through the whole process again. Although that, that doesn't sound very effective in war, but you are doing it by ranks. So while oh. you are firing, the rank behind oh, you oh, is sir. reloading. Can you, can you Usually, you are in three ranks. Oh, so oh, you sir. can you can get yeah. reloaded in twenty to thirty seconds, and you can cut it down even farther if you are not that worried. And and this is a this is a British tactic that you put your powder, you put your ball in, you don't worry about ramming it. You slam the butt on the ground to kind of get it down where it's supposed to be. And it, because what takes all the time is taking out your ramrod, yeah. ramming it, right, 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 right. putting the ramrod back. Yeah. And, it, and um, there are, particularly among the British, there are some units that using that kind of tactic they can fire three rounds a minute, uh, but generally, uh, you're taking a minute and a half to two. But there, you said there are three ranks. So there are three ranks. Yeah. So, and the other thing that you can do, if and some uh, units will do this, where they will put the best shots in the front rank. And the rear ranks are simply loading and passing the weapon yeah. up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they, you know, they take the shot, they hand it back, and it, it, uh, you can increase your volume of Is fire. Is that where the expression rank and file comes?